Counselor, we thank you, Lord. You are, you are the Savior of the world. We thank you, O Lord God, for being here this morning, Lord God, as the Savior of the world. We just praise you, Lord God. Thank you. Amen. Well, thank you that you have set us free, mm -hmm. Lord, that there is freedom in you. Lord, the world will bind us mm -hmm. with all their stuff. Their thoughts and opinions, their ways, um, which seem right in the eyes of man, in the natural realm. But Lord, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you have indeed set us free. Lord, set us free here this morning, Holy Spirit of God, yes, uh, that we would be loose from the things of this world, that we would be loose from the things of our flesh, yes. the things that bind us, the things that control us. We, we be free to worship and praise you with the body of Christ throughout the world here this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord. It is a privilege, Lord, to come together before you this morning. Lord, it is a privilege to know you, Lord, and to celebrate uh, the season, Lord, of um, we recognizing you coming to earth. Lord, we rejoice that you did that for us, Lord. We rejoice in... Um, your goodness and your grace toward us. Lord, we do uh, worship with all of those around uh, the earth this day, Lord. We raise up holy hands in praise of our Lord and God, the mighty one, the glorious one. Lord, we praise you for an opportunity to gather together. Lord, yes, we are small in number, Lord, but we are rich in spirit. Yes. Lord God, despite what we see, it doesn't matter. You are here with us, and that's what matters. Lord God, your spirit guides us and shapes us each and every day. Lord, we ask for the a great measure of blessing this morning, Lord, that we would be guided and shaped even closer to your image this day, Lord. We would understand you more and love you more. Lord, help us to see your glory in a greater way this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, Jesus, we do. We just thank you, Lord, that we can come into your presence, that, like we say, in your presence is fullness of joy. Your psalm, and the psalm says you fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. So we thank you and praise you this morning, Lord, for that fullness of joy that we can experience uh, alone with you um, in worship and prayer, or certainly when we gather together corporately. Corporately only takes two or three or more. And uh, we have that here this morning, Lord. So uh, we just praise you and thank you that in your presence is fullness of joy. You came to fill your people. That's why you came at Christmas, uh, to give us the fullness of Jesus Christ, who is full of grace and full of truth. So speak to our hearts this morning, Lord, as we continue in a spirit of worship and praise of you. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. The privilege it is this morning to um, stand before you to read God's Word. This morning we read some verses out of uh, the first chapter of the book of Luke. It will be verses 39 through 45. You can find that on page 1013 in our Pew Bibles. And if you're able, please stand. that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said will be accomplished. May God bless the reading of his word to your soul. You may be seated. Lord, 
here in Luke chapter 1, <coughs> contemplating the glory and the birth of our Savior, hopefully growing in our appreciation and um, adoration of Jesus, our Savior, I need a bulletin, I had one here, okay, um, last week we saw that Jesus' birth is foretold, the title this morning is in your bulletin. Uh, lessons from Mary's visit to Elizabeth, and um, there's a little space over there. I'll try to give you some fill in the blanks if you want to write them out. Okay, those of you that are inclined to do that. Um, the central idea is Mary obeyed God's word to her. Okay, so Mary obeyed God's word to her, and obeying God's word, word to her in these verses, we see the haste that Mary demonstrated. Haste means, you know, like, obviously, like, not like she wasn't frazzled or haste is, like, intentional, like, you know, and if there's ever a word that describes the Christian life as it relates to how we ought to respond to our Savior, it's like haste, make haste, you know, her, obedi her obedience there, seeing her haste. And then we see when Mary shows up on the scene with Elizabeth, we see the happiness that the Messiah distributed. Elizabeth was filled with joy and the baby leapt in her womb. So haste and happiness. So Jesus, we thank you for that fullness. And we thank you for the fullness of joy that you give. And we thank you and praise you, Lord, um, for Mary's visit to Elizabeth and the things you show us through this. Pray for the anointing and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as we continue in the spirit of worship in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the first fill in the blank is Mary arose, right? Arose and hurried to visit Elizabeth, right? We got in obeying God's word. We see the haste that Mary demonstrated. Mary arose and hurried to visit Elizabeth. Now, at this time, Mary arose and went in a hurry <laughs> to the hill country to a city of Judah. I'm in a hurry all the time, but not necessarily always over the right things, right? I was telling some, I mentioned in Sunday school class this morning, um, I'm always in a hurry. And um, I went to go have my blood drawn this week, and I got in the elevator, just as I got in the elevator, this other person came in the elevator, and they were like really kind and warm, and they're like, hi, good morning. And it was a woman, and I go, hi, good morning. You know, I greeted her, and then I'm like, my natural instinct is to get off the elevator, to get to the right, to get into the office, to get to get my name in the book, to get my blood drawn next, so I can get in and get out of there. And I said, I couldn't cut the lady off, <laughs> I couldn't rush her out of the elevator and through the door. Sure enough, she went before me, and it cost me an extra 15 minutes. I had to wait an hour and 15 instead of an hour to get my blood drawn. Um, so Mary's exhibiting him a good kind of haste and hurry. And we hurry in haste, especially this time of year. We think about, I gotta do this and I gotta do that. And I don't have time for this, but I gotta hurry up and do that as we're getting ready for Christmas and all the stuff that goes on with it. And there's good things to have haste for and be in a hurry for, um, but then we could get caught up in it also. Um, especially if you're wired, like I am. So, anyways, I let the lady go before me. Now, at this time, Mary arose, okay? So, remember, Mary arose and hurried to visit Elizabeth. And it says, now at this time. So, what time was it? Well, it was verse 36. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. So this was the time, right? She was, the announcement was that Elizabeth was also going to have a baby. And so Mary rose, arose and went to take the journey to go visit Elizabeth. And her response here is obedient obedience. And that's sort of obvious to us as we think about obe obedience. So like those of you that are... Um, well, you know, like if you have kids, or you have grandkids, or you're caregivers, or or your parents, um, we're forever trying to 
And I'm sure these three here in the front row have learned this lesson already. But we're trying to teach ours obedience. And so there was a good study that I had done or read or something about obedience. It goes something like this. Obedience is immediate. Obedience is without excuse. Obedience is without complaint. And obedience is without delay. So like if your mom or your dad tells you to do something and you're like, oh yeah, I'll do it in a minute. Well, that's not obedience. Or, oh, I don't really want to do it. That's not obedience. It's without excuse, without complaint, without delay. And so Mary gives us an illustration of this. A rose is a very fond word. Fond word of Luke. Um, it appears 60 times in Luke and 22 times in the rest of the New Testament. And the words are significant as it relates to Mary here. Mary believed the word of God, trusted the word of the Lord for her life, for what was going on, and she took action, right? Haste actually in the original indicates a strong and sincere affection. And I like affection. Think about we are to arise with haste as it relates to the things of the Lord because our affections are for Jesus. Not necessarily it's our duty, but that's our affections are um, for Jesus. So she learns this. Mary hurries to visit Elizabeth, and um, she took off as quickly as she could. We don't know exactly how far it was or where it was. Um, Luke doesn't specify the town that she was sent to, but we can assume it was like 50 to 70 miles from Nazareth to Zacharias' home. Good old Zacharias. How did... Mary find Zacharias. Well, in verse 20, it says, And behold, you shall be silent. You know the story, right? You're going to have a baby, and well, you know, um, and he doubted, and um, because you don't believe my words, then he couldn't speak, right? He couldn't speak until after the baby was born. And um, then in verse 22, but when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple and kept making signs to them, and he remained you. Okay, that was until the birth. Um, so he's doubting God's word to him. And later on, we see his repentance. If you look at Luke 1, 57, now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son. I love this story. I, I see this on videos and children's cartoon videos and her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her, and they were rejoicing with her. Now it happened that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. But his mother answered and said, No, indeed, he shall be called John. And they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who is called by that name. They made signs to his father as to what he wanted him called, and he asked for a tablet. And wrote as follows, his name is John. And they were astonished. And at once his mouth was opened and his tongue loose. And he began to speak and praise to God. I love that. I love that. Go back down to Luke 1, 41. Right? We're under, G, we're under Mary arose with haste. Um, went to go see Elizabeth. We're under the haste that Mary demonstrated. When, miss, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, I love this. The presence of Jesus do this. The baby leaped in her womb, and the presence of Jesus could do this, too. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Jump for joy, or leap for joy. The presence of Jesus fills people with joy. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Later on, Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit. So we could just say at Christmas, as part of the message of Christmas, Jesus fills people with the Holy Spirit. Or we could say Jesus baptizes people with the Holy Spirit. Like it says in Mark chapter 1. Read a couple of those verses. Um, and really, what is, you know, there's lots of different ways it is described, different theological positions as it relates to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What is just the fullness of the presence of Jesus Christ indwelling the believer? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the presence of Jesus. It's, it's Emmanuel, God with us. 
Mark 1, verse 8, I baptize you with water, John said, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Luke 3, 16. And so we need this baptism. We need this anointing. We need this fullness. We need this being given over. This could be the whole application for us for the whole Advent season. Fill fullness of Jesus. Luke 3, 16. John answered and said to them, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one who is coming is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And it goes on, and there's other verses, and then I'm going to give you one from Acts 13, 52. And the disciples were continually filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. So with that fullness of the Holy Spirit, there's joy. So in obeying God's word to her, we see the haste that Mary demonstrated in her going to see visit Elizabeth. Then we got in verse 42, the happiness the Messiah distributed, and the fill in the blank under that would be Elizabeth expresses the blessing that Mary's visit brought to her and to her baby. I'm giving you, I didn't play with the blanks were, but that's the thought. Elizabeth expresses the blessing. That could be the best of the Blessing. Elizabeth expresses the blessing that Mary's visit brought to her and to her baby. Luke 1, 42. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. In verse 44, For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. She cries out with a loud voice, right? This refers to a moment of ecstatic excitement to speak with intensity. She cried out in a loud voice because her heart was filled with wonderment, thanksgiving, joy, love. And she says, and blessed are you among women. So a person's blessed, right? The fill in the blank was the word blessed. A person is blessed when God's favor rests upon them. And we heard about that last week, about God's grace. God's favor certainly rested upon Mary. That's why she was blessed. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. I find that significant. Blessed. It's not blessed. It's not that Mary is this dispenser of blessing. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. So obviously it points to Jesus. This shows that Mary, not only is Mary pregnant, but also the very son is the object of the father's delight. Okay, not, not Mary herself. Matthew 3, verse 17 says, And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Right? Matthew 17, for, uh, verse 5, is a transfiguration. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed him, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. Verse 43 says, And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? Mother of my Lord. And Luke, Lord is used as a title about 95 out of the 166 occurrences that are Matthew, Mark, and Luke all together, 95 of them are in Luke. And Elizabeth says that Mary is the mother of my Lord, right? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. So certainly we know at Christmas, and any time when we think about our Savior, joy is um, uh, a very appropriate word. It seems that baby in the womb there was filled with joy at the, at the anticipation of the Messiah's coming. And we know that jo John the Baptist afterwards, we know afterwards his life, although it was short, we know that his whole life was about, he said so many wonderful things like, he must increase, I must decrease, as he was speaking about Jesus. And what did Jesus say about the Baptist? He said that among 
Among those that were born among women, there's not anyone that's actually greater than John the Baptist. And I love the picture of the Baptist, John the Baptist not being like a reed shaking in the wind and his strength and his steadfastness and uh, his purpose in living. And he, and he recognized, even here, recognized um, the preeminence of, of Jesus. So the joy that began in his mother's womb for John the Baptist would set the tone for his entire life. Like it says in John 3, 29. And he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. And then, and then he says, he must increase, but I must increase. So you know, I don't have to tell you. You know, you've been around. You know the joy associated with knowing Jesus, and you know the joy associated with him increasing and you decreasing, and you know the joy associated with the fullness of the life and the spirit of Jesus Christ indwelling you. And you also know, because you're of real stuff and you're made of flesh and blood, you also know the unhappiness and the lack of joy uh, we experience when our focus is on ourselves right? and not on um, our Lord. So let's start applying this. The first, applying the truth, if you're, one, if you're writing stuff down, thinking about obeying beings to God's word. Mary obeyed God's word. She made haste to go uh, see Elizabeth. The happiness the Messiah distributed as it relates to obedience. Let's beware. The film will be, let's beware of hardening our hearts to God's word to us. And there's so many scriptures like you're, you're in the word, you're in prayer, you're Believer, you're following the Lord, you know what God's word is to you in a given situation, a circumstance of life, and um, we can respond in immediate obedience and repentance to the Lord, or we can harden our hearts, or uh, we can make excuses, or we can justify our position of rebellion. Psalm 95 Verse 7, as we think of beware of hardening our hearts to God's word. For he is our God, and we are his people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as at the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they had seen my work. So today is an important way of word as it relates to our relationship with Jesus. Today is a day of salvation. Today is the day to respond in obedience. And the beautiful thing is, there's a constant and continual opportunity to confess and repent, right? And follow him, and starting now, right? Regardless of what happened um, before. And this comes into the category of being doers of God's word, not hearers only. Next, applying the truth here as we think about the presence of Jesus. The blank would be, uh, the sentence would be, the presence of Jesus brings fullness to people's life. And you would fill in the presence. Not P R E S E N T S. The presence of Jesus brings fullness. The presence and fullness to Jesus' life, to, to our lives. Rather. And there's so many wonderful, wonderful verses about that. And this is the essence of Christmas. Uh, the fullness of the light that he came to give us. John 1.16 says, For of his fullness we've all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten, the only begotten God who was in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him to us. So the fullness, Jesus is full of grace and truth. From his fullness, John says, we have all received grace upon grace. So from his fullness, we experience his fullness. Ephesians 1. So this is, this is application for sure. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he has put all things in subjection under his feet 
and gave him as a head over all things to the church, which is his body, and the fullness of him who fills all in all. So again, if you think about the Christian life, it's a life of, meant to be a life of fullness of Jesus, His presence, being filled with Him, being filled with His Spirit, Him increasing, we decreasing, through the power of the Spirit, through our confession, through our repentance, through prayer, through our taking up our cross daily and following, through our crucifying the flesh and crucifying ourselves, and the fullness that comes in Him. Fullness. Not like it's a little, little bitty bit, bit of Jesus here and there, but being filled to the full measure. Ephesians 4, 11 says, And He gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. How I love that Amen. verse. That's God's intention for you and for me and for all of His born again children. To a mature man or woman. I should have brought in a could have illustrated this with a, um, a statue of some kind. To the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. It's like the fullness of Christ. And growing up in Him who is the head. To the measure of the fullness of the stature. The fullness of who Jesus Christ is. All of His attributes. All of His characteristics. All of the fruit of the Spirit. All the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the love, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, the love, All that being filled with that. And Paul said, being continuously filled with the fullness of Jesus Christ. So the presence of Jesus brings fullness to people's lives. The next application that we're after is the presence of Jesus brings joy to people's lives. The presence of Jesus joy to people's lives. Jesus said in John 16, 24, Until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be full. Imagine praying that. And that goes along with some prayers in Ephesians and some prayers in Colossians. Imagine praying that. Asking in His name that we would be, um, that our joy would be, be full, would be made full in Jesus, fullness of joy. That's certainly the message of Christmas, right? Joy, joy. What? Good. I'm glad. I'm glad you're with me. Luke two. That's, that was the announcement, right? angel of the Lord suddenly stood up among them before them, and the glory of the Lord stood around them, and they were terribly frightened. Verse 10 of Luke 2, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Born for you. Joy. The joy of Jesus' presence in a person's life. Matthew 2.10 2, says, When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Right? One of my favorite verses, I've, quote, I've read it to you many times on joy, is 1 Peter 1.8. Though you've not seen him, you love him. And though you don't see him now, but believe in him, greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. So it's possible for all people, regardless of your temperament, regardless of your disposition, regardless of your wiring, regardless of your family of origin, and all that.
that stuff, greatly rejoicing with joy inexpressible and full of glory. It comes from fullness. It comes from our relationship with Jesus. Obtaining is the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul, Peter says. One of my favorite verses about joy and we're under the thought of the presence of Jesus brings joy to people's lives. I've read this already. You will make known to me, this is Psalm 1611, you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In your presence is fullness of joy. That's like a battle cry. In your presence, in Jesus' presence, is fullness of joy. In the world, in the flesh, in the devil, in yourself. Fight against that so much. Yeah, Jesus' presence is fullness of joy. Help me, Jesus. Enter into the fullness of your joy, the fullness of your presence, as much as I can, this side of the grave. All these things are things we can go after now. We're not going to have to go after them later. There's no more world, flesh, and devil when we're in heaven, and it'll be perfection, but it's special now. I think it is special now when, regardless of what's going on around us, and it's a fight, because a lot of our temperaments and dispositions don't gravitate toward in your presence as fullness of joy, or don't gravitate toward joy, right? But it's in the presence of Jesus, and this is who we're after. And he's made this possible by coming to be our Savior, to be our Emmanuel. John 15, 11, one of my favorites as it relates to this and our abiding in Christ. And he says, these things I've spoken to you so that my joy I got to give that illustration. I don't think I gave it as a, 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 a sermon setting yet. These things I've spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete, Jesus said, as it relates to abiding in him Apart from me, you can do nothing. And my Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. My daughter says to me, Daddy, don't be sad. Be happy. I love you. She says to me on many occasions, be happy. I love you. And it's like, Amen. <laughs> I'll wait for the day where she says to me, Daddy, don't be sad. Jesus loves you. It's nice that she's saying to me, be happy. I love you. Like, that's, that's going to cover over everything, you know. Or whatever. Daddy, don't be sad. I love you. There's the joy, right? The joy of Jesus that transcends situations, circumstances, everything. You sense, um, I'll give you this one, I was going to skip this one, I'll give you this one real quick. Jesus brings great blessing, fill in, fill in the blank application. Jesus brings great blessing, blessing to a person's life. And that's what we're talking about here. And you know, what's the classic verse that speaks about, one of the classic verses that speaks about the great blessing, happiness, blessing, blessed are you, that Jesus brings to a person's life. Anybody? In the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, 3 through 11, I'll just read them. Jesus' presence brings great blessing to a person's life. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. The humble one, the one who recognizes their need. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who are gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. There's that picture of meekness. Power under control. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And all this is tied to Jesus. Blessed are the merciful, 
for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And then he says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. All right, you ready? Last application. Last fill in the blank. Unless you decide to email me or text me this week as you think about the message and you read Luke 1, 39 through 45, and you think about Mary's obedience to God's word, and you think about the haste that she demonstrated, and you think about the happiness that the Messiah distributed, filling um, both Elizabeth and the baby in the womb with joy, and you think about other ways that um, these truths apply to you this morning. And you text me some more of them. But here's, here's the, another one. Ready? It's a question. Do you have a sense of urgency? Underline the word urgency toward the things of God. Urgency. Right? Haste. An urgency toward the things of God. Remember what I said? The word original haste meant like affection. And there was the affection that Mary had. You, you are now urgent towards certain things because of your affections towards Jesus Christ. There's a there's a urgency now to how you live and move and have you be. Be. There's an urgency now toward the things of God. There's an urgency toward worship. There's an urgency toward prayer. There's an urgency toward Bible study. There's an urgency toward fellowship. There's an urgency toward being with the saints. There's an urgency to gathering together with the saints in corporate worship. There's a sense of urgency toward washing each other's feet. There's a sense of urgency now toward sharing the gospel. There's a sense of urgency of declaring this glory amongst the nations through our giving to missions. There's a sense of urgency toward living and moving and seeking to follow the Lord and being obedient to the Lord. There's a sense of urgency toward dying to self and living toward Jesus. There's a sense of urgency and living toward the Lord and for the Lord. Amen. I, I, I hope there is for all of us. Amen. I hope there is. Amen. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Because there's no place for coasting in the Christian life. And um, the ladies heard of devotion on that, and a little excerpt from uh, a sermon by John Piper on that, and um, I listened to it a couple times, and I think I'd like to preach something on that about there's no coasting in the Christian life. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, urgency. Again, because our affection, this is because of where our affections are now toward Jesus. That's what makes the urgency toward living for him. 2 Corinthians 6 2 says, In working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Where he says, At the acceptable time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So urgency now. How we live now. We don't know how much more time we have. We don't know when it'll be our last breath. Mm. We don't know when our heart will stop beating. We don't, we don't know when it'll be the last day. So we want to, because of our affections for Jesus, because of our recognition of who he is, we want to live this life as much as we can for him. To hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. To be being perfected uh, more and more into his image and likeness. Or how about Matthew 
2442 as it relates to the urgency. These things I've spoken to you on the last Sunday. Um, I guess it's over here. I write it down and I marked it. Matthew 4, 22, all over the place as it relates to his second coming. Therefore, be on the alert. For you do not know which day your Lord is coming. My oldest daughter tells me I'm hyper vigilant. Dad, you're just too hyper vigilant about this, that. But you gotta not be so hyper vigilant towards certain things, right? You can all be a little more hyper vigilant towards the Lord, towards the things of the kingdom. Therefore, be on the alert for you don't know the day or the hour that your Lord is coming. So it should also affect the way we live. All right. I was going to have you guys do one of these things, but I'll do it. I hope that won't break me. Here's the illustration. Scooter. Scooter? You guys have a scooter? Yeah, I, I ride my the basement. All, all right, then. Come on. You're going to do this for me then. Because I could hurt myself. Yeah. We're not going to take that. So this is kind of shaky. So don't put too much weight in it. But what do you... Just go ahead. Go down the aisle. Show me what you're doing to scooter. Yay. Get that thing going. And then you coast. <laughs> wow, he's fast. I'm so coasting. Out the back door. There he is. Now he's coasting. Good man. No coasting in the Christian life. There's no coasting. I meant to coast. It's a, it's a, it's a fight. It's a, it's a going after. Um, no coasting. So, Mary obeyed God's word to her. There was the haste that Mary demonstrated. There was the happiness that Mary distributed. Your foundational question, you want to write this down, if you want to write it down, it will be like this. How is God inviting me to take ownership of the obedience of God's word and the fullness of joy that Jesus' presence brings to my life. How is God inviting me to take ownership, ownership of the obedience, underline obedience, that God's word and the fullness of joy that Jesus' presence brings to my life? How is he inviting me to take ownership of the fact that I'm going to be obeying his word? How is he inviting me to take ownership of the fullness of joy that his presence is meant to bring to my life. So if your temperament is morose and your temperament is your disposition, it's, it, don't, it doesn't matter because the joy that Jesus gives is, transcends that and the joy that Jesus gives uh, bursts over and bursts through that and as we're dying to self and as we're filled with the Spirit by the one who baptizes us with the Spirit, there's fullness. The Christian life is meant to be a life of fullness of joy, fullness of grace, fullness of truth, fullness of the presence of Jesus in us. Colossians 1.19, as I close, says, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him, that is, in Jesus, for the purpose that His fullness would dwell in us. Because remember, we read that verse that said that you built up until the full measure, it's like the full measure of the stature of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. If you like, and, and you know, your quote for the week, Oswald Chambers says, God's purpose is not to perfect me to make me a trophy in his showcase. Like, you know, like a trophy in the showcase, like, I don't know, this is a figurine, and, and a trophy, you put it in the showcase in there, it just stays in there, and it just kind of stays on display, and doesn't have an effect on anything except it just sits in a showcase. No, his purpose is getting me to the place where he can use me, right? And let him do what he wants. As well, Chambers said on 12 2, and that devotion. Right? And that's that stature, the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ in the life of a believer, and how that transforms individual lives, how that transforms churches how that transforms people, communities, and this is what he came to give us. This is who he is. And so, if we're not experienced that to the fullness, then the problem isn't with him. Um, the issue is with us in our hearts, but we're moving toward this. Right? That's the good news, we're moving toward this. So do you see that, beloved? 
This is what Christmas is desire. This is what Christmas is all about. Paul, in that quote, and Jesus in the scripture, he talks about fullness. His desire, our scripture's desire, God's desire is that we would experience Christ's fullness. Okay? This is what I want for you, beloved bride of Christ. This is what I want for myself, that we would experience more and more the fullness of Christ. And it affects how we relate to each other. This affects everything. I guess I'll end with this prayer that um, I used to have a dear beloved saint who told me they prayed this prayer for me every day. It's in Ephesians 3. And it's Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. And this is what we're talking about here. And this would be a great thing for us to pray for each other. For this reason, Paul said, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be, and here's the key, to be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit in the inner man. For what purpose? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. So we can pray that for each other. That we be filled up to the fullness of God. That we would know the fullness of Christ at Christmas and always. Mm. And is this possible? Is it possible? It is. Scripture says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond what we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, the Holy Spirit, to Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Now, who, Him, Amen. it's like if we pray this and if we want this and we pray this for each other and you pray this for your kids and you pray this for your spouse and you pray this for yourself and you pray this for your church and you pray this for, we pray this for one another, promises God's able to do even beyond, abundantly beyond what we even ask and think as it relates to this. And that's really what he came to do at Christmas. So Jesus, thank you, praise you. We lift our hearts up to you, Lord. Oh, Lord, oh, fullness. Suppose fullness and joy in your presence is the message here. And um, it's what was exhibited there with Mary's visit to Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth saw Mary and the baby and the presence of Jesus being there and the effect that Jesus had on both Elizabeth and both on John the Baptist and the fullness of life and the fullness of joy that you came, Jesus to give your people. So we just thank you and praise you. And Lord, in those areas and times and it happens, you know, when we're not full of that fullness and we're not full of that joy, Lord, that we could go to you and we could ask you and, and where self is eclipsing some of that fullness and joy, Lord, we could put it to death by the power of your spirit and ask, Lord, you to fill us with joy in your presence. Or to create us a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within us and restore to us the joy of our salvation like you did for David. Yeah. So Jesus, we just praise you and we thank you. Lift our hearts up to you. And thank you that you're a God who's able to do abundantly beyond what we even ask or think or imagine in this area or in any area of our lives. We praise you in Jesus' name.